Hello everyone, welcome back to our P4 SS Plus Competition DMD. Thank you very much for taking a look at this video. So, my name is Teacher Chiu from Think Academy and I'll be going through the solutions for the Week 2 DMD for our P4 SS Plus Competition. Now, let us begin with question 1. So, a caterpillar crawls from A to C without passing any point more than once. How many different paths can this caterpillar crawl? So, I think this one is a very straightforward combinatorics related question over here. So, there are two stages, if you guys notice. We need to travel from A to B first, and then followed by B to C afterwards. So, now you guys notice carefully over here, that from A to B, we have three choices. Right, so we can travel from the right side, diagonal or bottom. And then afterwards, from B to C, we actually have two choices. Now, the idea goes along this line, do we? Now the question comes whether we should multiply them or add them up together. Well, it can't make sense for us to multiply them together because it is a stage idea. So this one is the first stage. First stage. This one is the second stage. In this case over here, when we talk a bit about stages, we usually tend to multiply them together. But you guys can think of it as like a tree in that sense. So there are actually from the this one is what we is this is also what is known as the multiplication principle as well. So by this multiplication principle, there are a total of Three times two equals six ways. Well, which is pretty less, and you guys can actually list it out. So you do not necessarily need to know the tricks over here uh, about this multiplication concept. But what you can do in the event of this kind of small scale questions comes out, you can actually just multiply them together. Now, so hopefully this one clears up a little bit about permutation and combination questions. Now let's move on to question two. So when Amy comes home from work to uh, school to cook. She has to do the following things. She needs to stir fry for 8 minutes, wash rice for 2 minutes, pick and wash vegetables for 5 minutes, and cook rice in the rice cooker for at least 15 minutes. By reasonable arrangement, it should take her at least how many minutes to finish these tasks? So, this question is really about optimization. It's about some, it's a little bit about practical application. So, you guys notice a little bit carefully that what we can do is that we can wash the rice and throw the rice into a rice cooker. So wash rice will take up 2 minutes of your time. And then rice cooker will take up 15 minutes. So you guys look at it a little bit more carefully. If I put my rice in the rice cooker to cook, I can actually do complete my other tasks as well. So in this case, I can actually stir fry for 8 minutes and wash vegetables for 5 minutes because they add up to just 30 minutes over here. So in this case over here, I just while I'm waiting for rice co to cook, I can do my stir fry, I can wash vegetables as well. So the only times that I actually wait, uh, that I actually spend time on is only washing rice and cooking the rice in a rice cooker. So that's why it should take me at least 2 plus 15 equals 17 minutes in total. It, we, I do not need to wait for the rice to cook completely before I start stir-frying and washing my vegetables. That's the main idea behind this. Alright, so I hope this one clears a little bit up about optimization and planning and things that can be done concurrently and things that cannot be done concurrently, right? So let's move on to question 3 now. So we need to fill in 0 to 9 into the figure without repetition with the rule that for any adjacent hexagons, the bottom number is larger than the top number and the right number is larger than the left number. How many ways are there to fill in the numbers? Now, so we'll consider some simple cases over here. But of course, as you can tell, there must be some sort of ordering implicitly in this whole hexagon already. So, 0 and 1 kind of makes sense to be here. Alright, I mean, of course, 0 and 1, uh, the 1 can definitely be here as well, but we are just considering, considering a general case. 
All right, we'll definitely take into account that later. And we suppose eight and nine can be here as well because they must be at the corner. Zero must definitely be ne definitely be at the top. So that's how we actually get these little help lines over here right now. We have gotten count kind of gotten four numbers without loss or generality, right? Right. Now, so I'm going to start labeling the rest of the numbers and then we see what numbers we can try to fit inside. All right, so these are my numbers over here. We have A, B, C, D, E, F. Now, you guys think a little bit about it. We can definitely, for us, for us, A can be either 4 or 5. That's the crucial component behind this. The idea is somewhere along the lines of looking at the numbers, the possible number arrangements that are happening over here. So let's take a look closely. Suppose we have A go 4. Right, it doesn't make sense for us to have B equal to C equal to 3. Or the other way around. Now, D can be equal to 5. 6, 7, alright? Or other way around. And D can be equal to 5, 6, 7 with, the, with E and F taking up the remaining two numbers. So there are, in this case, 2 times 3 ways equal to 6 ways for this case. That's the main idea for A go 4. Now what about A go 5? Well, in this case over here, A is equal to 5. You must have D equal to 6, E equal to 7. Or the other way around. <laughs> That's the main idea. And then afterwards, we have C equal to 2, 3, so, in total, go six ways as well by multiplication principle. So, the total number of ways is really just six plus six, you go 12 ways. That's the main idea for this question. The main idea is to try and identify what is the number over here, or what are the possible combinations that we can actually accept for this case over here. And that's the main idea. Right, so in this case over here, uh, in this case over here, that is how we will attempt this question for question 3. Now let's move on to question 4, alright? So there are 66 airlines in a region. Given that there is one airline between every two cities, how many cities are there in the region? So let's take a look. Suppose we have, say we must minimum, minimally have two cities, right? Must minimally have two cities. So that would mean that there's one airline, right? And what about three cities? If I were to have three cities, I would have one plus two airlines. If I were to have four cities, let's let me use another color, I would have one, two, three more airlines. So as you can tell, one two cities where one airline, three cities. 1 plus 2 airlines, 4 cities, we have 1 plus 2 plus 3 airlines. <laughs> so, if I were to have 66 cities, right, we will have some sort of a number, plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus dot dot dot, all the way until f minus 1, being equal to 66 over here. Right, by our Gaussian sum formula, which is n, n minus 1, over 2 it'll be equal to 66. Now, by solving, by solving directly over here, we notice that n multiplied by n minus 1 is equal to 182. And this one is a quadratic, all right? But we do not, we do not provide solutions. Uh, we do not use our quadratic formulas or other alternative methods such as completing a square to try and solve this question. But instead, we try and infer. So in this case over here, we can kind of infer that n is equal to 12 because 12 times 11 gives us 132. And hence, there are 12 cities in the region. Alright, so 
I hope that everyone can understand this. We can actually draw out a little bit of simple pictures to try to generalize the idea. And that's the whole concept for question four. Now let's move on to question five. All right, so uh, the diagram is on the other side, but I'll talk a little bit about it first. So triangle ABC has an area of 24. We have DEF being the midpoints of BC, AC, and AB respectively. What's the area of triangle DEF? So we know that the whole area has to have four. We have midpoints D, E, and F as midpoints, right? Yep, so we have D, E, and F being midpoints. All right, triangle A, B, C is to have four. Now this one is actually one of the very common topics taught in MO. It's known as a half area model. Why? So you guys look carefully. A, B, D, and A, D, C must have the same area. Right, because they both have the same base and the same height, H, because D is the midpoint. Now, that's the main idea behind this. And what's the area of ADC? This one is just 24 over 2, which is 12, because they have the same area. So, by repeating this argument consistently, by repeating this argument consistently, we will actually get a very nice solution over here. We will actually notice now we can continue from ADC. Now we can take a look at these two triangles now. We'll see that this one will just be 12 over 2, which is equal to 6. And then afterwards, all we really need to do again by a half area model, 6 over 2 equal 3. And that's our final answer. The area of triangle DEF is just equal to 3. Alright, and that's it. Alright, so I hope everyone can understand this. This one is really regards midpoint, re regards to midpoints, and they are very useful over, uh, for us actually, for especially for these kind of questions. When we have midpoints, the half area model usually applies. Alright, so this one is some question, uh, some simpler question about geometry, so I hope everyone can understand this. Now let us move on to question 6 now. Complete the long division table. What is the quotient? Looks very complicated. Looks a little bit... Uh, we have very little information with regards to this one over here. But what we do know is that the remainder is zero. That's probably one of the main solutions that we actually notice. Now, another thing that well, so how can we start? Right, that's the main question. Well, we can actually start by looking at these three boxes over here. These three boxes looks very easy to write. Well, you guys think about it. I have a three-digit number. Four-digit number over here, subtracting a three-digit number. What does that really mean? That really means that I cannot go over, I can't have a 4-digit number in this case, but I can go very close towards a 4-digit number. So, chances are, this is going to be 1, 0, and 9. Because if I want to add one more, I'm going to hit 1,000 over. And it's going to go over, and hence, I can't continue my division, right? Because we are always looking out for the remainder. That's how the division algorithm works. So, in this case over here, we can always give, we can guess that this is 1, 0, and 9. That's the m most important idea behind this question right now. Alright, so let's do a little bit of labeling. So uh, I'll call this L. Alright, and then I'll call this as D, E, and F. And then I'll call this as K, and then I'll call this as M. Now, so what's next? What's next? So if we notice, if we notice a little bit of a little bit of things over here. Now, let us take a look at the second line over here. What does this tell us? Now, this one is multiplied by 7. So, this one will immediately tell us that this is 1. Because, if D is 2, the result must be a four-digit number, right? Because if I were to have two, 
2 multiplied by 7 in this case is going to give us 14. 14 itself is going to be a 4 digit number, it's going to be 1400 plus because 2 is on D. And so we can already infer that D must be equal to 1. And from this, we can already kind of guess hey, maybe K can be equal to 7, 8, or 9. That's the main idea. We can have, it is possible, it is entirely possible that k is equal to 7, 8, or 9. We can't really have the other numbers now because minimally we must multiply by 7. So it can be 700 over, 800 over, or 900 over. So let's try and find the correct one. Uh, in this case, I'll talk about the wrong ones first. Let us take a look at k equal 9. It's kind of impossible, right? If k is equal 9, what will happen? 9 subtracting 9. We will get zero. We are not going to get anything over here. Right. So impossible, right? Impossible, all right? In this case, impossible. It will be impossible for us. Right. Now what about this? K equals seven. Well, let's take a look at some numbers that can be nicely divided by 7. Uh, in this case over here, 714 can be divided by 7. So maybe m is equal to 4. But that would, what would that mean? That would mean that 102 is df. But it's impossible. Because... This one, last few lines, is a four-digit number. So even in the worst-case scenario, say this one is 9, for example, 102 times 9 is not going to give us a four-digit number, and it wouldn't be able to make sense. And that's the main idea behind this one over here. I hope you can understand this. So we must have k equal to Eight. And we have two choices right now. There are two choices. Either either 812 or 819. Right, based on inference over here. So if it's 812, this will tell us that DF is equal to 116. And if it's 819, it will tell us that DF is equal to 117. And one of them is going to be possible, impossible. If I were to take a look at this, 116, I need to multiply by 9 in order to hit a 4 digit, you know, hit a 4 digit number. We know that 116 times 9 is equal to 1044, which is impossible, right? Because it's a 5 over here, and here must start with a 5. And 117 times 9 is going to give us a 1053. And that's the one that we want. Hence, DEF must be equal to 117 in this case. And that's the whole concept behind here. So in this case over here, we can already kind of tell that this one is actually 9. That's the main goal. That's the main goal. And we already have the F. So now we know that going back towards this portion, right, we know we know a lot of information right now. We can already conclude that this is 117. And then there's a 9. Now we just need to find L. I notice that df times l must be 9, must start off with a 9. So this one will give us the idea that l must be equal to the 8. Based on our inference from all this, because we know that df is 117. That's the main goal. So the quotient, finally, will just be 117 times 879, which is equal to 102843. And that's our final answer. Alright, so I hope everyone can understand this logic. It's a little bit difficult, uh, especially with regards to uh, understanding and inferring uh, on where do we start. That's the main concept. And uh, it has a lot of contradictions. We have lots of cases to consider. But I hope everyone can develop this little skill over here. Uh, and I hope that this whole argument makes sense to you. Alright, let's move on to the next question. Question 7. So, car A and car B drives towards each other from two towns. Car A travels at 56 km per hour and car B travels for 8 km per hour. 
The two cars meet 32 kilometers from the midpoint. What's the distance between the two towns? Well, there are quite a few ways to do it, but did you chew this time round? I'll be going through the more algebraic approach it, because algebra itself is extremely useful for a lot of mathematical Olympiad competitions. But as you can tell, this one is kind of a standard PSLE-like question. So let's let the distance be x, all right? Let's let it be x over here. How does the distance work? Let's take a look. So maybe we have two different towns over here. Let these two be x over here. And maybe car A may... Uh, naturally, naturally, and maybe let car A start from here and car B start from here. We definitely have the midpoint known as x minus 2, x over 2. And they are going to meet around here, which is x over 2 plus day 2. Right? That's the main, that's the main concept. Now, how do we form our simultaneous equations in this case? Well, let's take a look at car A, alright? So, how long, how far did car A travel? Well, car A traveled for some t number of seconds, which I'm not sure about. So, let t be the time when they meet. So, distance, speed, time, right? So, if I were to travel at 56 kilometers per hour, for t hours, I'm going to cover x over 2 plus day 2. And if I were to travel 48 t, uh, for 8 kilometers per hour, for t hours, I'm actually going to cover x over 2 minus day 2 because it, is reversed. it has a perspective of car b. So, solving the simultaneous equations, I hope the majority of you guys know how to solve this. We actually get t is equal to 8 and x is equal to 832. Alright, so we can actually use a method of substitution or elimination to try and solve this too over here. So, we don't just collect t but we also collect the distance as well. So it's a very powerful tool. But of course, I understand that there are a lot of other different methods and the, uh, different ways to uh, approach this question. But I just want to share a little bit more advanced method because we are uh, definitely looking out for students with this potential to be able to absorb a little bit more, uh, you know, attend our S classes. All right, I hope this one clears up. Now, let's talk a bit about question eight. So three-fifths of the smaller square and 506 of the bigger square, sorry for the error, is covered by the shader region. So the area ratio of the smaller square and the bigger square is a particular ratio. So if we look at this a little bit carefully, all right, so we know that 3 fifths of the smaller square and 506 of the bigger square is covered by the shader region. So now, it can't make sense for us to try and let x be the area of the smaller square. So it's by the shader region, alright, just take note. And let y be the area of the larger square. So we are going to focus on the unshaded parts where 1 minus 3 fifth of x being equal to 1 minus 5 over 6 of the y. That's the main idea. Because we are looking at the unshaded regions. The area must be the same. So we have 2 over fifth of x equal to 1 over 6 of y. And we are going to get x to y equal to 5 over 12. So x to y, so we have x is to y equal 5 is to 12. And what would that really mean? So this one would mean that there is a 3 unit shaded. And this one would mean that there is a 10 unit shaded by our proportion over here. Right, 3 fifth or smaller square. So 3 over 5 times 5. And 5 over 6 of the bigger square. 5 over 6 times 12. And hence, we are going, just going to get 3 is to 10. And so hopefully this one clears a lot of things up over here. So as you can tell, algebra uh, is really helpful. It's really useful for us. Now, let us move on. Hopefully this one clears everything up. Now let us move on to question 9. So there are two trains. 
The express train is 160 meters long and travels 25 meters per second. The normal train is 140 meters long and travels 15 meters per second. It takes how many seconds from the front of the express train catching up with the rear of the normal train to the rear of the express train overtaking the front of the normal train. Alright, so in this case over here, let teacher Chu talk a little bit about it first for question 9. Now, for question 9, alright, we have this particular uh, train over here that is trying to catch up. Alright, it's 160 meters long, travels 25 meters per second. What about the normal train? The normal train is 140 meters long and travels 50 meters per second. And what's our end goal? Well, our end goal is for the train over here to reach here. I mean, it's 160 meters. So, if you guys think about it, effectively, effectively, it is going to travel for 300 meters. But because the other train is also driving as well, so in this case over here, in this case over here, what we are looking is that we are looking at the effective speed. So the total distance must be 160 plus 140 equal 300. The effective speed will actually be just 25 minus 15, which is equal to 10. So the time naturally will take 300 over 10 which is 30 seconds. So I hope this one is clear. Alright, so with that, this, this, is, this is question 9. And I understand that there's a question 10 that's hanging around. But question 10 was went through by me on the previous videos uh, that I provided some particular extra practices over here. But not to worry, uh, I'll go through it as well since it's also inside. So what was the question? Given a four-digit number, A, B, C, D fulfills the condition that A, B, C, D is equal to a plus, sorry, as A, B multiplied by C, D is a multiple of 1, 1, 1, 1. Then the minimum value of A, B, C, D is some particular number. So I think we have went through this question already, but not to worry. If you guys missed it, I can always go through it again. No worries. So let's begin on this question. So the first thing that we should do is to try and look at this A, B, C, D plus A, B times C, D and try to factorize it out a little bit and see what we can infer out of it. So in this case, we have A, B, C, D plus A, B multiplied by C, D. It's really just 100 A, B plus C, D plus A, B cross C, D, which is A, B multiplied by 100 plus C, D plus C, D. Now we are trying to factorize it a little bit more again. So what we notice is that we like 100. So we are going to add in the 100 and then we're going to subtract 100 to compensate. And you notice that we have two of these guys so we can factorize it further. So we get AB plus 1 multiplied by CD plus 100 minus 100 equal to 1111k because it's a multiple of 1111. So we are not sure what k is but it's definitely some number. But we can start doing a little bit of iterations because we want to find the minimum value of A, B, C, D. So we can suppose K is equal to 1 because it's probably the smallest number. We're going to get A, B plus 1, C, D plus 100 being 1, 2, 1, 1. Now this one would mean that A, B plus 1 is just 1, 2, 1, 1 over C, D plus 100 which will be lesser than 1, 2, 1, 1 over 100 in this case because we are removing some number from the denominator. So this one is going to be roughly 12.11. So this one will give us the idea that AB equal 11 or 10. But this is impossible. 
because neither 12 nor 11 are factors of 1, 2, 1, 1. That's the main idea behind this. Alright, so now we can guess, hey, maybe k is equal to this time around. So we are going to have ab plus 1, cd plus 100 is equal to 3, 2, 2. And we're going to do a little bit of prime factorization for this one. Well, we're going to try to arrange all these numbers nicely. We know that AB plus 1 is going to be a 2-digit number. CD plus 100 is going to be a 3-digit number. So we're going to try and mix around. And we'll eventually end up with 18 times 1, 2, 9. Because we definitely need 100 each over here for CD. So that looks like a plan. And we can already kind of tell that AB would just be AB plus 1 would just be 18 from this idea over here. And this will tell us that AB is equal to 17. And CD bar plus 100 is 129, telling us that CD is equal to 29. So hence, ABCD is equal to 1729. And that's the main idea for our last question of our this week's DMD. So I hope the logic is a little bit clear. And uh, really, it requires a lot of inference, you guys know this. It requires a lot of advanced mathematical thinking. So with that, I thank you very much for viewing this video over here. And hopefully, uh, and keep a lookout for our next DMD that is coming up soon. And as usual, we are, Teacher Chu is going to come up with weekly solutions for this as well. Now with that, I will see you again. If you guys have any questions, feel free to contact me through WhatsApp as well. Alright, see, see you guys next week.